This is NDTV. And you're watching NDTV Prime. In association with Micromax. Nothing like anything. Ride and review the Thruxton and Speed Triple from Triumph. It's the A3 launch finally. We have the details and the strategy from Audi. And it's a facelift and a significant repositioning on the new Fiat Punto Evo. Hi folks and welcome to CNB. I'm Siddharth Vinayak Patankar. We have so much coming your way. You've already had a little glimpse of it at the start. You have seen these two bikes. And uh, you know what? We've been wanting to do this for some time now. Get some of the Triumph models in for you. Talk about them because the brand's been now in the market for a few months and it's starting to pick up some traction. So we decided to go with two different categories of bikes and so which is why we have a classic and we also have something a little bit sportier, what of course Triumph likes to dub as a roadster. And so uh, that's the Speed Triple and this one is the Thruxton. So we've got these two for you. Besides that, plenty more coming up as well. But uh, you know what, we've got the bikes here, they're ready to go. Let's start off with these bikes and joining me on that ride is Bala. When you walk up to these bikes, it's an instant love triangle of sorts. While one is classic and rides with style, the other is mean and implies speed. No matter which bike you pick, there is no dearth of love. From classics to roadsters to super sports, Triumph has managed to offer almost every kind of motorcycle to the Indian buyer. Ever since Triumph surprised us by launching 11 bikes in one go at its market debut in November 2013, the brand has got great attention. The company says it now has over 600 bookings and has nine dealerships in its network. So it's really high time we got our hands on some of these beauties, right? Now, while the Bonneville and the Street Triple might be the hot favourites in the Triumph range, these two, the Thruxton Cafe Racer and the Speed Triple too, have their share of fans. Bala has the Thruxton today. So let's indeed start with the classic, shall we? Named after the high-speed British circuit where Triumph enjoyed great success in production racing, the Truxton follows the tyre tracks of the legendary 1960s Truxton T120R. Although based on the Bonville, the Truxton's cafe racer looks give it a distinct appeal with a typical single seat. And the bike also tends to look much larger than the Bonnie. The rear cover comes off to give you a pillion seat. The low and narrow handlebars are angled towards you with the classic bar and mirrors. Twin instrument pods with analog dials add to the classic appeal. Over to Siddharth for the speed triple. One glance and the bike gets you. It captures you. Ensnares you in its gaze. Staring you in the face with its bug-eyed twin headlamps, the speed triple roadster doesn't try to hide its attitude. Packed with more power and muscle than the popular street triple, the example of the bike with us is a Roadster, which is dressed in this killer electric blue matte finish. Though Triumph says that now it's only going to be available in black, red and white. The bodywork on the bike is designed to show off its muscle, especially over the large well-sculpted fuel tank. 
The aggressive hunched forward stance and the twin silencers beneath the short stubby tail section catch your eye almost instantly. The instrumentation is part digital, part analog and comes packed with programmable gear change lights, a lap timer, a trip computer and a fuel gauge. But that's not all. When you start to hit the higher revs, the blue LED light strip that lights up instantly on the panel, almost goading you to keep the performance quotient nice and high. Now the Cafe Racer styling is now familiar, thanks largely to the Royal Enfield Continental GT that came out earlier last year. And now with this uh, Thruxton, you kind of get that similar kind of feel to it, especially with those bucket seats. Uh, so that kind of appeals to you, the old British kind of classic Triumph associated brand on the trucks. Very classic looks. In fact, uh, Bala, when you think Triumph as a brand, for me anyway, and I know a lot of people in India, it just goes back to that whole heritage. And so when you think of the brand, you do think of bikes that look like that. You know, you want to see a little bit of chrome. The irony though, it is the bike that's with me that uh, actually is the highest selling model for the brand now globally. So you don't really see as many of those as you see. Uh, of these. Of course, in India, all of this is still fairly new. And so uh, when you talk about these bikes, I think both these bikes play a good role in creating a good brand image. The Street Fighter looks, though, that you see on this particular model, Triumph was the first company to really go big on Street Fighter. Now, I think pretty much every global brand Bala has one of those in yeah. their portfolio. Interesting but color also. I mean, that one really appealing. But this military kind of green feel to it with this nice little golden line in between kind of appeals and kind of is in line with the overall classic look that it has. But that matte blue is something that I've been eyeing for a while now. It is very sexy and you're right, that uh, green, very British, very nice. Having spent a lot of time on the Royal Enfield Continental GT, the riding stance on the Thruxton wasn't too unfamiliar. Fortunately, the forward lean over the tank to the handlebars, along with the placement of the foot pegs, make the riding stance less taxing on the arms. But I'm still not sure if long distance riding might be such a great idea on the Thruxton. The bike's simple tubular steel construction keeps it very steady, even at low speeds, despite its weight. With 41 mm forks and chrome rear adjustable shocks, the ride is firm and handles well in poor road conditions. But tight cornering isn't so easy with the placement of the handlebars making it a tad difficult. The braking though inspires lots of confidence with the front wheel fitted with a big 320mm single disc on the 18-inch wheels and a disc on the 17-inch rear wheels as well. A similar engine to the Bonville, the 865cc parallel twin on the Thruxton turns out 67 bhp and has 69 Nm of peak torque. The 5-speed gearbox is precise and the throttle response is smooth and predictable. And getting to 3-digit speeds doesn't take too much of an effort. The Speed Triple is built on a modern twin-tube twin spar frame with agile and sharper handling and doesn't feel as heavy as it looks at 214 kgs. For a motorcycle with so much of a sports bike character, it was surprising to see how the upside down forks on the Speed Triple with adjustable rebound and compression damping took to bad roads without one flinch. The braking is spot on with the Brembo's radial four piston calipers with ABS doing the job really well. The riding position is quite aggressive and more sporty with the low handlebars, high footrests and the rider's seat sculpted deep for a forward leaning position but you can sit up in a conventional riding posture too. On the Speed Triple, the engine is a different powerhouse altogether with a three-cylinder 1050cc engine. There's 134 bhp on offer with 111 Nm of peak torque as well. You get ample power lower down the rev range too. The six-speed gearbox is quick and making the bike snarl is a finely tuned three into two exhaust, which also boosts the engine's torque. On the downside, the clutch lever is a bit hard and takes some getting used to and the engine does generate quite a bit of heat in stop-go city traffic. So on a hot and humid summer day like this, that's not fun. The classic Thruxton is priced at 6,70,000 rupees ex-showroom Delhi and will appeal to those looking for the classic British motorcycle 
with its retro cafe racer looks and want to make a statement. It sounds nice too, is agile and smooth and makes for a fun riding experience. The more powerful Speed Triple is priced at 10 lakh 31 thousand rupees. Ex showroom Delhi. It's definitely quite the naked bike with lots of sporty character and totally killer looks. So while we told you before that both these bikes offer different shades of riding that you will love, our matchmaking advice is to pick the one that's closer to your personality rather than simply your budget. A3, we've talked about it for some time, we've showed you the car, we've even showed you the made in India car, the one that's assembled here anyway. Now it's here, we know the prices, we know the kind of strategy as well. So we want to share that with you because uh, it looks like that particular segment is also only going to get bigger. Audi itself is going to have the convertible or the cabriolet version of the A3 by about Diwali. And then you'll also have the hatch by the start of the new year. So what's the plan? Let's share it with you. Since it is a new segment that you get to address or you get to address a new space, let's say, and create that for the uh, Indian buyer, um, it is what we've been talking about for some time now, right through you know, when the market was slow the last two or three years. This is the thing we've been saying that, look, creating new segments and offering even more value and uh, you know, more to people at different price points seems to be the way to go. So you've set the cat amongst the pigeons today. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen the, the range and I think it's uh, part of our, our customer centric approach. We've really seen that uh, there's a demand for, for smaller, more compact cars. But uh, that should also mean luxury. There is no need to forgo luxury when you go into a smaller compact class. And that's why we've gone with the A3 sedan. We think uh, the, the success of the Q3 has demonstrated that there's a lot of people who are also wanting to drive the car themselves, looking for a, a, a more a suitable car, perhaps in urban environments. And that's where the A3 sedan perfectly uh, fits that, that strategy. I think it was a nice little camouflage you had going because, you know, Everything we were hearing from Audi India was all about, you know, market conditions have changed since we first decided to bring this car in. Um, inflation has gone up and of course, you know, even, even the rupee has weakened. So, you know, don't have the kind of expectations you had three years ago. Uh, and yet you've surprised us with the, with the prices. So how difficult was it to achieve that kind of an entry price? Well, it was also, it's the first car that we're launching uh, right from day one in uh, producing in India. And I think that was uh, key to the strategy. Uh, we launch a car from day one, produce it in India, and that's been able to uh, ensure that we've got this uh, wonderfully attractive uh, price point of 22.95 lakhs. You know, I remember before the uh, sedan, and of course even before the hatch came out in Europe, when you had the concept car at Geneva a few years ago, mm. it was of course shown as a concept sedan. And uh, at the time, this seemed like the no-brainer when it came to India, because, you know, this is what people want. Um, this space though, not just the price point, but also you know, the fact that you have this entry premium space as I call it now. Mm -hmm. um, you have seen a few hatchback models come in as well. That surprised the market that they were accepted because you know, the conventional wisdom here says hatchbacks aren't premium, they can't mm -hmm. be clubbed as premium, but, but that's st sort of worked for some of your rivals. Yep. Um, the, the fact that you now take that segment into uh, you know, a much higher orbit, uh, what does it do for the, for the overall premium segment, do you think? Oh, look, I think uh, when we look at the A3 uh, sedan, we still firmly believe that the sedan is what people are looking for. Uh, our model, uh, our uh, volume expectations, I guess, were that maybe this would equate for roughly 15% of our volume. Seeing what uh, the reported uh, sales of our competition in the, in the hatch space maybe suggests that there is a significant upside to those volumes. So I think we're going to see a, a real game changer in the Indian market with this car. It is time for us to slip into a short break. We've got the Fiat Punto Evo on the other side of that break. Keep watching. Welcome back to CNB. Now we're going to talk about that car that I've been promising to talk about, the Fiat Punto Evo. It is a new name because, of course, there's a bit of a facelift as well. But what's interesting is that the car looks significantly different, looks fairly pretty and attractive, and has been repositioned just like the linear was as well. Is it enough, though? Well, first, let's get you the details on the car, and then you can be the judge when you know all the prices and the other details. It's at the 2014 Delhi Auto Expo that Fiat India first shared its plan of bringing four new cars to India. 
Two out of the four are cars we know and weren't strangers to the country, so with the facelifted linear already launched, it had to be the Punto next that got the scalpel. A long pending facelift in fact, since the global makeover on this third generation car happened in 2009 and 2012 and we received neither. But, be that as it may, finally our Grande Punto is giving way to the rechristened Punto Evo. So now let's tell you all about this new Punto Evo, shall we? The hatchback's new face will be exclusive to our market and so that means it doesn't follow the global design language. So basically, this is now the Indian version of the car and you won't get it anywhere else. I know what you're thinking. The Punto Evo is a preview of the Aventura, but it was not supposed to be that way. The Punto was supposed to receive a completely different face, but after the overwhelming response that the Aventura got at the Delhi Auto Expo, Fiat was left with no choice but to give it this new face. Or at least that's the logic the company is giving us. Let's see now. For what it's worth, the classical Italian looks on the European car work better in many ways to create a stronger brand definition. But okay, let's go with Fiat India's take on this. The front end of the Punto Evo receives redesigned headlamps and a completely new front bumper. The hood now sports a bulge with two prominent lines running down all the way to the Fiat logo. Now you've got to wonder if the Italian designers at Fiat have taken a cue or two from the Germans here because as attractive as some folks may find these elements, the car seems to lose its quintessential Italian flair. But to be fair, the new Punto Evo is still a good looking car and appears more ample than before. The side and rear profile of the Punto Evo more or less remain the same but the changes continue on the inside. There's an all-new dashboard and though it looks similar to the one seen on the new Linear, it looks refreshing for the Punto itself. The plastics have a dual-tone black and beige interior theme across the entire lineup, barring the sporty Punto Evo 90, which gets an all-black treatment. The feature list on the top variants is fairly extensive, but it doesn't really add anything new in terms of equipment over what the Grande Punto used to have. So there is automatic climate control, Fiat's Blue and Me Bluetooth connectivity system, which combines CD, MP3, USB with aux in, Bluetooth and voice recognition. Our peeve with the Grande Punto was quality of the materials and this cabin sadly continues that tradition. Amea tried to adjust the height of his seat and the plastic cladding on the lever decided to come off. The engine lineup is the same but on that one not complaining. So there is the 1.2 litre petrol and the 1.3 litre diesel which have been carried forward from the previous car. There will also be a sporty 1.4 litre petrol engine on offer and from what we've heard the Punto Evo will come dressed in Abarth gear with a special version soon. If you loved the way the previous generation of the Punto drove, you love this one too. There's a lot of grip on offer and the car is calm and collected at high speeds. The figures then will seem familiar to you. The petrol is surprisingly sprightly, though you do miss the sporty zeal that the 1.4 unit offers once you compare the two. And here's why. There is more power on tap and the 1.4 also appears to be better mated to the gearbox with good throttle response and quicker gear shifts. And finally, the car that most buyers look at, the very capable 1.3-litre multi-jet that dominates sales not just with Fiat models, but also for all other cars it goes into, like the Swift, the Indica and the Beat. The new Punto still handles like a dream, but having a hydraulic power steering assist has its drawbacks and the steering might feel a tad heavy when in city traffic conditions. That is of course when compared to the electric steering on most competitor cars, the VW Polo and the Hyundai i20 in particular. The Polo just got a facelift too and the second generation i20 launches next week, which is why repositioning the Punto was in Fiat's best interests if it hopes for any traction for the updated car. Now for the price of the car. 
We'd expected the Punto Evo to be priced lower than the Volkswagen Polo, and it is. While the petrol Polo starts at 4 lakh 99 thousand rupees, the Punto Evo kicks off at an introductory price of 4 lakh 55 thousand rupees for the petrol variant. The diesel range for both starts at 6 lakh 27 thousand rupees for the Polo and 5 lakh 27 thousand rupees for the Punto. The outgoing Hyundai diesel started at 5 lakhs 94 thousand rupees. The next generation i20 arrives next week, followed by the Tata Bolt and eventually the new Honda Jazz. Considering the amount of competition that's coming its way, Fiat looks to have got the timing and the pricing right with the new Punto Evo. So as Amaya was saying there, you've got the recently facelifted Polo, you've got that Jazz coming in and of course next week the new i20. So that space also looking really hot. Please do share what you think about it and of course the new Punto Evo as well with all of us here. On that note, it's time to say goodbye and uh, also, as always, there is that reminder, please wear your seat belts, please wear your helmets if you're on a two-wheeler. And uh, Auto Prime brings you the best of automobiles right through the coming week, 8.30 p.m. on NDTV Prime. And in fact, we've got a brand new show coming up, so I'm gonna leave you with a quick look at that. That's something for you to look forward to in the coming weeks. React to that as well. Bye-bye. <laughs>